Hey everybody, it's Bandar Tyrell and I'm back again doing another video. This time I'm going to be doing a kind of an intro video using Substance Painter for Second Life. But I'm going to go into some other areas that I've not gone into before with things like filters and layers and masks. and Really try to show you how to do some creative, cool things to get more realistic textures out of Substance Painter. Like you can see the building behind me. Um, I did those textures in Substance Painter using some of these techniques, and it was really fun, and I got some really neat looking stuff out of it. So uh, we're going to play with some of that today, and hopefully that'll be helpful for you. Plus, I've got some updates on some things I've told you in the past that I now do differently, so I'll try to cover those as well. But let's go ahead and see if we can jump in here. This is me and Second Life. Let's jump over to uh, what I decided to do was I wanted to work on something, something simple. So I decided on an axe. The good thing about this is it has two different components that we're gonna play with. One is metal and one is wood. So they're gonna have completely different look and feel and we'll get to experiment with different things in Substance Painter to try to create the best of uh, both a wood and a metal material that will look good in Second Life. Um, so I made just a very simple axe here in Blender, but there's some key things you need to know or you need to do in Blender before you go to Substance Painter. You need good clean geometry and you need good clean UV maps. You have to UV map these things before you take them into Substance Painter or it's just not gonna, not gonna work. So let's take a look. I have this, it's an ax, but it's in two parts. Now I could join those together and make it one object. Um, I could have one material that covers the whole thing and just say, okay, this part of the material is where the metal goes, this other part of the material is where the wood goes. But I find when I'm taking things into Second Life, I want to have them separate so I can modify them. Because I typically don't do just one texture for something. I'll do like five or six different woods and then you know five or six different metals or something like that to give you some options. And it works better if they're separate. Now, if I'm not going to do that, and I'm just going to have one texture set for the uh, for the object, I I might join it all together, and I might even have one material that covers everything. But I tend to not like to combine the wood and the metal in the same material. So this is just the way I do it. You may find it differently. What I find is in Substance Painter, if you do use one material for everything, then you've got to use masks and things to separate the the parts that you want to paint or that you want to put textures on and that's more work and so if i separate them in blender before i take them to substance painter it's less work in substance painter it's just more direct and easier to work on so um, the way substance painter treats parts of your object is it doesn't know parts it knows materials and so based on what materials you assign it in blender is the texture list that's going to show up or the parts list that shows up in Substance Painter for you to work on. So uh, this is my axe head and uh, I'll show you the UV map real quickly. This is going over to UV editing mode. This is what I have um, for that. And it's not perfect, but it's good enough. And then um, let's see, let's take a look at what the handle looks like. This is the handle. It's just straight wood with the, the ends. This is the, the the top and the bottom of the wood. Now, I've talked about this before. When I do wood, I always try to make sure that my wood, the longer sections of the wood go, their UV maps go horizontal. And that's so that when I use textures that have wood grain, most of the ones that I have or that I use, the wood grain is horizontal. So I don't have to rotate as much and I don't have to play around with it if I just keep it that way. So whenever I work on wood, I always try to make sure that the wood pieces in my UV map are horizontal. It doesn't matter as much for other things, you know, for painted surfaces or for metal surfaces. Um, there's not a real grain to it. But if you are working on something that has a very distinctive pattern, then you, you really want to try to make sure that your UV maps are, are grid-oriented so that they're either horizontal, vertical, or that they're box they're boxed in so that those patterns apply correctly. Um, so anyway, this is wood, so I keep it horizontal. That's just that's just me. That's just how I do it. All right, so that's the two pieces. I've gone ahead and exported this. And when you export, there's one thing you need to make sure you do. Um, you, I, you can do it in FBX format for Substance Painter, or you can do it in Collada format. 
And since I am big on efficiency, I don't want to do things twice. So I always just use Collada because Second Life only does Collada. So uh, there's not much point in exporting to FBX for Substance Painter and exporting in Collada for Second Life. Just do it once, right? And then when you do these, there's an option here under Operated Presets that's for Second Life. SL is Second Life. SL plus OpenSim Static. This is not a rig model, it's just a static model. So I select that and it sets up the different parameters correctly so I don't have to worry about them. And I did make a mistake one day and I had a problem when I I got the thing into Second Life. Some stuff was just not right. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. And it was with my UV maps. It was like they were inside out. And I was like, what is going on? And it had to do with the fact that I had some of these checkboxes weren't right. And I came back in here and realized, oh, yeah, I forgot to do that step. It didn't show up correctly. Um, so I just try to make sure I always do that. And then export it. And uh, there you go. I already did it, so I'm not going to do it again. Now I'm going to bring it into the second life. I'm going to do new. And then the question comes in. This is one of the changes to what I was doing. So which template do I find that I use the best for producing things to go into second life if I'm doing PBR? And it's also whether you do Blinfong or PBR. It doesn't really matter because I have different output templates for both. But you need to have make sure that you have the correct inputs as well. And that's done through the input template, which sets up your shaders and the different channels that you have associated with it. Now, what I was telling people to use before was down here, it was called PBR Metallic Roughness Alpha Blend Starter Assets. That's what I said in my last few videos to use because it was working really well for me. But I was having a problem when I got to Second Life and I would import my materials. And sometimes I'm importing a ton of materials. And uh, they would all come in with alpha blend instead of uh, alpha mode set to blend instead of alpha mode set to opaque, which made them transparent. And so you, you did, might not notice it right away, but when you start getting a couple of things on there, you notice that your, your model's transparent and you can see through it. And it's like, what? So you have to manually change all of those different materials to alpha mode equals opaque. Uh, and I was like, Ugh. and then I, somebody said something in a video one day that, triggered it and I realized it was because I was choosing this one that says right here alpha blend so this is setting alpha mode to blend so I said aha let me find a PBR metallic roughness that doesn't use alpha well there's this one but it I tried it and it still did alpha blend so then I started looking around and go oh well, is there another PBR one and there isn't but there's it, it, there kind of is uh, but then I found this one up at the very top it says ASM and I don't even know what ASM is for but ASM PBR Metallic Roughness Starter Assets, and there's another one, ASM PBR Metallic Roughness SSS, which stands for Subsurface, uh, Subsurface uh, Scattering? Something like that. And so we, I, we don't use that for Second Life, so you don't need that one. So I just tried this one, and, it's, and it works really well. And then when I export and I import it into Second Life, Alpha mode is set to opaque, and I don't have to change it all the time. So if you're going to work on something that has opacity, that you want like a, a glass window, you need to change the shader. So you can use this template now, and then you can change the shader later when you export and choose a shader that has opacity, set your opacity up, do the export. You don't have to choose that template. You can always change it. So that's what I do for some things. Like if I'm working with glass, I'll go back and just change the shader to one that has opacity. But for this... Uh, this work, For me, this works better. So I'm, I choose ASM PBR Metallic Roughness Starter Assets. Um, then I'm going to pick my file, which is in the my D documents, and it's called Sample X. And make sure, I always do 2048. I think I get the best results with 2048, especially now that Second Life actually has 2048 by 2048 texture upload. Um, they just look so much crisper and so much better, and they don't they don't get fuzzy when you, uh, when you scale them and things. Uh, and then normal map format for Second Life uses OpenGL. So if you don't do that and you set it to DirectX, your, you, your normals will come out inverted, which means if it's supposed to be lifted up, it's pushed in. If it's supposed to be pushed in, it's lifted up. And so you don't want that. So make sure you set that to OpenGL. That's it. Hit OK. And now it's going to load my Axe model. And there it is. And the very first thing that you need to do is... Um, you have to set up Second Life to have all of the maps that it needs to generate things like edge detection so that it can do edge deformation and edge 
uh, make your edges look uh, lighter or whatever. Um, and thickness and curvature maps are the ones that are used to drive that. And by default, we don't have a curvature map, a thickness map, and stuff like that. In order to get those, we have to bake our mesh maps. And so you have to go to now, you used to do it differently. This is how you do it now. You go to mode, bake mesh maps, where you hit control shift B, and it brings up this panel. And under common settings, um, by default, what we're loading is the low poly mesh. And so this, this model is considered the low poly mesh. And for some of these um, maps that we're going to generate, we need a high poly mesh. And so you can get, you can get by without it, but it's not going to look as good. And so just click this little checkbox here that says use low poly mesh as high poly mesh, unless you have a high poly mesh, which I don't, or you could, not check that box and you can come up here and just load the same file that's what i used to do but they added this checkbox so now you don't have to do that so just use low poly mesh as high poly mesh and then go down to uh, ambient occlusion again this is something i do you don't have to do it if you don't like it but i find i get better looking results if i do this set the secondary rays it comes in as a default at 64 i like to pump it up all the way to 256 and that's in three places it's on ambient occlusion it's on curvature and it's on thickness the other thing you need to do, which I forgot to do, so I'm I'm uh, I'm going to return to my painting mode. Oh, I think I can do it from there. Yeah, I could have done it from there. Let's just go back. Um, I didn't choose my environment, which is my lighting, and so by default it uses panorama. I think it uses panorama by default, and panorama is what we call a one-sided HDRI light, and so it lights one side, and one side is in the darkness, and so the back side of your model would get shaded darkly while the front is illuminated and that makes sense if you're building some piece of furniture that's going to go up against the wall but if you're using something like this that should be free floating you want uniform light all the way around it so you need to have a two-sided panorama and i have a video on how to do that so there it is display settings environment map set to panorama and i show you in another video how to create this panorama two-sided and then uh, there's other parameters in here you could play with, uh, but I'm going to leave them alone. There's one for, oh yeah, we're just going to leave those alone. And then hit bake, selected textures. It's going to go through and it's going to create all of those different mesh maps that we need to be able to get our good looking output. You always have to do this whenever you bring your model into Substance Painter this is the very first thing you have to do. And you can look at this model in here and you can see if you look look for deformity. So if you see shadows or something in here or deformities, you'll know that something's wrong with your UV map. And sometimes there is and sometimes you have to go back and clean it up. And notice how the bottom is darker than the top. That's because it's laying down. So the, the um, two-sided panorama doesn't address up and down. It only addresses around it so the bottom is still going to be darker so i could fix that by standing up my model in blender i think you might be able to rotate this in here i don't know how to do that so i'm not going to bother with it but anyway just if if you wonder why is the bottom darker that's why so for now that's good enough we'll go back to painting mode so here we are in painting mode and there we have our two things that we're going to play with and we have our why does that look transparent that's just weird it does, doesn't it? It is. I can see through it. Hmm. Um, so let's let's start with the wood. And so normally what I would do in Substance Painter is I have a lot of these things called smart materials, and I have a lot of materials. So if I would come to my this is your materials, this is a filter that says limit my asset my asset tray down here to just show me. So materials, this one is smart materials. And so what's the difference, you ask, between a material and a smart material? Well, material is just one layer <laughs> with no filters or no anything applied to it. Smart material is a is a bunch of layers with a bunch of filters and masks and things like that that are applied. And so you can create your own smart materials and you can create them in here. And so that's what we're going to do today is we're going to play with that. So instead of going in here and picking, and you can fill put a search in here for wood and that 
filters it down to show me just these are all the smart materials that I have so I'll, I'll show you like I'll take like uh, this gold edge one and I'll put it on here and you can see what it looks like so it applies the wood you get the nice wood grain and then it has some edge detection and so now why is that transparent so I must have something wrong with my model in a second one that this is coming out transparent is my is my normal flipped it could be. Let me go back. And this is say I didn't. I'm doing this uh, live, and I'm doing it as we go. So let's go back to second line. Oh no, second line. Uh, Blender, and let's look at this. And then if you go to object mode, pick faces, and select all, you can turn on this little symbol right here. That will show you the, your normals. And yep. I don't see it. There should be little blue lines which indicate the face, the direction of your normals. And if you look inside, if I could see inside, uh, they're all pointing in. That's why you don't see them. So all I got to do is go up here with my faces all selected, and they are. Go to Mesh, Normals, Flip, and see now you have the blue lines coming out. And that way you know the normals are facing to the outside. Uh, let's check the head just to make sure. So all the faces on it are already pointing out. So they're good. All right, so now we just got to select this whole thing again. We're going to export it. Just export it to the same name in the same place, Sample Axe. Now all you got to do when you go back to Substance Painter, go down to the Edit menu and hit Reimport Mesh. Now it reimports it. And then just to be safe, let's go ahead and bake our maps again. It should remember the settings, so I, I probably don't have to change that. Um, yeah, now now you can tell it's not not see through. All right, and just to make sure that it did remember everything. It used to be sometimes when you would change the model that it would forget these and you'd have to reset them, but it seems not to do that anymore, which is good. You return to paint mode. There you go. Now you can see the wood on here. That that's this wood, which has. Um, it's a wood with like gold at the edges, and so it's treating all these as it's getting a lot of the gold in there, which I don't really like. Uh, but you can see uh, this is what's inside that smart material. It's called wood and war gold. It has all these layers, and you can turn them on and off, and you can play with them and experiment with them to modify how this looks. But somebody went through a lot of effort to make this, and it generally works well, but we're not going to use that. So instead, we're just going to use a standard model or material. I could even go further than that. I could just use a color and then we could start building our own wood grain if we want. But there's one in here called Wood Rough. So that's what I'm going to look for, which is kind of like the basic out of the box substance painter wood grain. So we're just going to stick that on there. And it already looks pretty good, right? But uh, let's scale that down because I think the grain's a little bit too big. So let's just double that by hitting two on tiling. And now the wood grain is tighter. Looks a little bit better. I think I can live with that. If I don't want to see the axe head, I can come up here and turn this little eyeball off. And it, oops, wrong one. It hides the axe head. But it still knows it's there, so the shadows and everything still show up. But now we just look at the wood and just isolate it. Now, I'm in 3D view. You can also go into a 2D view or both 3D and 2D view. And so... It's kind of over here somehow. I don't know why. This is the 3D view. This is the 2D view of that map that we have. Um, that's rotating, but I don't mean to do that. I'm just trying to get this to be bigger. Move it around. Um, but you can paint on either one of these. You can paint here or you can paint here. And sometimes it's beneficial to use... Uh, use this view the 2d view instead of the 3d view especially if you want to try to make lines that are straight you can you can make them straighter here you can also see your uv maps and stuff like that by looking at your different maps um, from this drop down but we're going to go back to the 3d only view and play with that okay so i've got this wood grain on here and it's cool but i want it to have some some more character i want it to have uh, some better defined 
um, wear and tear, some scratches, some dents, some things like that. So let's first off, let's just go ahead and delete that. We don't need it in there. Um, so th these are layers, and they're a lot. They're, the layers are a lot like they are in Photoshop. So they stack. And what that means is things on the top of the layers show. It, 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 what you're seeing is a combination of all the layers, but you're looking at it from the top down. So what you see on the model is what it is at the very top of that stack. And so in, in this case, I have this wood rough and it's blend mode, layer blending mode is set to normal and it's 100% opaque, which means nothing underneath here is really going to show. So if I want to... Uh, have some things underneath it that show then I have to adjust some of these parameters to get them to show up alright but let's say I want to make this have some dirt on it so well we can say okay let's put some dirt on here so let's find some dirt I'll just type in dirt and see what I've got um, here's one called mud and dirty road what is this abandoned castle yard dirty path Stones and dirty road. It's got rocks in it. I don't really need rocks. Let's just pick this one, the mud and dirty road. And I'm just going to drag it onto my model. And so that goes on my stack, and it's above the wood rough. Now, you can see that that's a leaf, which is really big, and uh, there's some dirt here. So maybe I'll scale this down a little bit. Do the same thing, tile that to two and see how it looks. It's a little better. That's that's fine. I think one probably would have been okay. Um, in fact, I'm going to go back to one. All right, so there it is. I got the dirt on here. But now you don't see the wood anymore. And that's because what I was talking about with this the layers and the way things stack on my layers, that this has got its normal and it's 100% opaque. And so this doesn't show through. So... It is having some effect on some of the channels, but uh, not on the not much, right? So I don't really want this dirt to be <clears throat> uniformly applied everywhere. I want it to be, I want it to show up in just some some places. So there's things I could do to get rid of that. And the first thing you want to do is you want to add a mask, and we're going to use a black mask. And so just right click on this and do add black mask. So now you don't see it at all, and that's what a black mask does. So a black mask says we're going to have a little texture image in this. That's what this little box has. There's like an image in there. <clears throat> and that image covers the whole thing too. So areas that are in that mask that are black, the layer underneath will show through. Things that are painted in that mask that are white, the dirt will show through 100%. And if you use varying degrees of white to black, so you use gray scale, you use different shades of gray, the lighter the gray, the more the dirt will show. The darker the gray, the less the dirt will show. And so I could just come in here and paint on that directly using a paintbrush. And you can see as I paint, the dirt shows up. And where I don't paint, the dirt doesn't show up. And I can change the size of my... And did that. I could change the size of this. I can pick different brushes. So I could say, like, let's pick this brush that looks like a dirt brush. And that's a really big one. So let's let's just let's take the size down to that's too small. Take the size down to about there. And then we'll just start painting on some dirt. We'll paint dirt here, paint some dirt over here, paint some dirt there, maybe make it bigger and stick some dirt here. And but I'm not very good at applying that dirt and it doesn't look so good so get rid of all of it i think i got rid of it okay so instead of painting on the dirt i want to replace this with um with an image and so let's do an effect up here and we're going to say okay we're going to add a um add a fill layer and then in this fill layer i'm going to add uh, an alpha, which are in here. somewhere. Where's my alpha? Alphas are in here. So I could do like a, 
Well, I have grunges. Where are my grunges at? Grunges and textures. Here are the grunges. So I could pick like this grunge dirt. Uh, let's pick this one, like this grunge leaky dirt. I take that and drag it over here into this. And so now it's applied it. And so it looks speckled and you can, it's, it's kind of hard to see. It doesn't really make it that impressive, right? So there, you can see it here. I'm turning it on and off. You see it? There's some, there's some spots here. And then I have some, I can, I can adjust the balance of this uh, grunge material. So that gets it like much. So if you go all the way over, it shows up hundred percent. So you can change it and drop it down. I can also do the contrast, play with those parameters. You can invert it. There's things you can do to control how that behaves and how it looks. Um, but we're not going to use that. So I'm going to get rid of this just by deleting it. I'm going to go back to my mask. I'm going to add a different thing. Let's call it, let's add something called a generator and see what it does. So now when you add a generator, it says you have a generator, but it's empty. So you come down here to this thing where it says generator, no generator selected. You click that and it brings up a list of the generators and there's one called dirt. So now, now it's applied the dirt to this and let's see what, what it looks like with it turned on and on. So it just looks a little dirtier. And then you have controls for this. So just like you did with the grunge, uh, I can control some of the, like, how much dirt. If I turn this on, I can play with it. I can adjust the contrast. So some things get really dark. I can also go down here and say, let's use uh, the amount of grunge. We'll play with that. We can add more more of it and we can also scale how how it looks so that's the uh, it uses a grunge image and it's using its own grunge but if I wanted to go back and use the same grunge that I had before I could come down here and say um, use a custom grunge is true and then I would pick which grunge I want to use and I would pick the same one that I had before so I'm just going to go with what it has uh, play around with it a little bit so that gives me one look like that. Uh, and this is just visual, right? So let's say I wanted to do, um, I wanted to have something that would affect scratches and things of that nature. Well, I can do that as well. And I, oops, I don't want to choose a brush. And the way you do it is, is slightly different. All right, so what I can do is I'm going to take Look at these grunges in here, and um, notice there's one here called directional scratches that looks pretty good. There's a directional noise that also is kind of cool. There's oh I have dirt as filter, so let's take that off. There we go. Now you can see there's more of a purling noise. Um, these look kind of cool. These marble ones. What are they called? Oh, these are cloth folds. There's some cells. There's directional noise. Directional noise is kind of kind of good for this. Um, this has all my textures, and I need to get rid of those too. Some grunge dirt, grunge concrete. I kind of like this one, grunge cracked deep, but they're kind of running this way, so I would need to rotate it. These are spots. That's kind of cool. Grunge, dirty, scratchy. There we go. We're getting into some cool ones. These are, oh yeah, some of these are kind of cool. Oh, that one looks neat. Grunge stains heavy. That might be good. All right, so let's try that one. We're just going to drag it on our model. Uh, oh, what do we want to do? Height. So we just dropped it on height. And so what that does is it puts it on the model and only selects the material of height. And so all these other ones get turned off. So it's only going to affect height. And then we can adjust the uh, parameters on this. You can, you can use this widget 
and you can rotate it and you can scale it all through that widget or you can use the sliders so it, it kind of does the same thing so I want to get it rotated so that it's kind of going the direction I want like that and then I want to scale it uh, but it's only inside this box so I need to get that box bigger um, and that's one of the things if you do it this way by dragging it on the model then you, you work with it this way so there's another way you can do it too you can do add a fill layer like this which covers the whole thing and then you go down to your base color uh, height uniform color and you drop that into height and then turn off all of these so the only thing that we have is height and there it's applied uniformly to the whole thing and if I go back up to my parameters and I rotate it you can see it's rotating so let's go ahead and do 90 degrees on my rotation and then if I want to scale it so you, another thing you can do is you can just look at your uh, mask mm. like something like this you play with the rotation there they are I was wondering where they are gotta get those offsets to see so there's some scratches are gonna show up up here let's tile this one more kind of like that the white is where it's, it's gonna show right and then adjust the offsets Okay, that's that looks cool. So let's go back to our map material. Okay, so now it's there, and it, it's putting these scratches on there, which is kind of cool. Um, but if I don't want it on the height, I could actually put this on normal, but I'm not going to use a height map. Or it will automatically convert the height to normal as well um, let's see let's tile that one okay so that's a way to add it to the entire object to give you some more character on it I think it's too much so we can go into the parameters and we can adjust them some okay so that's a different way of doing it uh, another way of doing it would be to um, you can you can also do something similar to what we did with the uh, with the putting the dirt on here. You can do you can do some edge detection and things as well. So you have a lot of control. You have the ability to manipulate any of the different channels. So if I wanted to do that, I could. If I wanted to put some spots on here, what I could do is I could say, okay, let's go back and um, let's get a, a variation of the wood. Let's do a different wood. So this is wood rough, right? So let me go back and get another version of wood rough. Why am I doing the wood again? I already have it. Drag it on top. So that's what we see is this one, but I want to change, let's say the color. I want to make the color darker, more like that wood. <clears throat> okay, and now I want to put a black mask on here, and I'm going to go up to add an effect. 
And I want to do add you add a filter. And then select a filter. And the filter that I want is um, no, I don't think it's a filter that I want. So I'll get rid of that. Not right yet. Not yet. Anyway, I want to do a generator, and I'm going to use the generator called Metal Edge Detection, something like that. And then, so you can turn it on and off to see what it's doing. But I'm going to turn it way down, like so. Adjust the contrast kind of like that. <clears throat> so it's now blending those two different wood textures into one. Flip it off. This is one. On. Man, look at the edge. See how you got the really dark around the edges here? And then, oops. Which is a kind of a cool effect, right? So that lighter wood is showing through here in the center, but around the edges, like if it's worn down more, it's darker. Same thing on, on those sides too, right? Okay, so there you go. We played with a bunch of different things. We used two different generators. We used some filters. We played with some stuff to, to get it to look better. And I haven't used any smart materials yet. So now what I could do is I could come in here and say, okay, well, um, I want to make this and turn it into a smart material. So I'm going to just right click and see that. Create smart material. Why can't I create smart material? Select all of them. I still can't create a smart material. I don't know why it's not letting me create a smart material. That's what I've done before. So I'm not, like I said, I'm not an expert on this and I don't know everything. So, huh. Um, I'll try to find out why and put a note. Or if you know why, tell me. Anyway, so that's, that's what I would normally do. Is I would save it as a smart material and it would show up in my smart materials folder here. And it would be, it would show up and I would be able to do what I want to with it and apply it some other time. But we're not going to do that today. Okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, let's go down here. We're going to play with the axe head now. So there's the axe head. And again, I can take that and I can say, okay, we're just going to stick a smart material on here. Like this. We can just go grab a smart material that looks kind of cool. Like this sunken metal is too rusty. I don't want that. This dark metal, dark, rusty dark metal. And there you go. So it's it does put it on there. It does do some edge detection. So it has an edge detection here. It didn't do it on that edge, which is where I really wanted it to do it. But it's still, it looks kind of nice, but a little too simple, right? Turn that on the back on. It looks okay. And if I was in a hurry, I could go with that and that would be fine. But let's let's do something like uh okay, I want that to be this way, but I want something a little shinier down here on this edge. So maybe I'll take this metal coated and I'll stick that on there. And that gives me this look. And again, I'm still I'm playing with smart materials, right? So this is you can do it with regular materials or smart materials, but right now I'm playing with smart ones. But let's go ahead and add a black mask to that smart material. Oh, I think I know why. I needed to do a, I know why, I know why, I know why. I needed to make a group. It wouldn't let me save it as a smart material because I needed to create a group and put it all inside of a group. We'll go back and do that in a minute. <clears throat> all right, so I just did this smart material on the metal coated piece. And then what I want to do is I want to 
um, kind of do, uh, I want to paint that on here. We're using a brush and I want to pick a different brush. Oops, sorry. Wrong one. Pick a different brush. And something fairly like that. I'll go right along the edge. Well, that's way too big. Maybe something. I want it to have a little bit of a fade, and I can add a blur to it too. So we're going to go like this and scale that down, size it down to here. And just paint on the edge like that. So I can manually paint that edge and make it look more like how I want, like it's got a sharp edge. And because I chose this kind of this brush that's very faded, I get this really nice um, fade out towards the uh, sides. Drop that on. And then I need to do it on the other side as well. Which is harder to do. Let me see, because it's so dark. lighten that up anyway I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that side so you can see that's one way of manually doing it and um, I could then add uh, what's called a filter so I could add a filter on this and then in this filter I could pick blur and it's gonna blur it up a little bit and I can change the intensity of the blur, see what it's doing. See how it does that? So if I wanna make it blend in a little more, just adjust this blur. So maybe here, and then I can also add something called a level on here, which will help me adjust this and it will tighten it up. See how it pulls it in? So it's still blurred, but now it pulls it in a little tighter. Is it bright, brighter here? Makes it more of a defined edge. <coughs> and that's just using these filters to adjust that. So I did, a, I did a blur filter and I did a level on that. And let's see what other things can I do here. Add. I think that's good for now, for, for that, right? It still doesn't look as good as I want, but I want it to make it look rusty. So how can I make it look rusty? I want to add some rust on here. So let's find something called, let's go to my materials, look for rust. Find just a plain old rust like, uh, like this one here. And I'm going to drag it on. Again, the whole thing turns rusty, which if you like that look, you're welcome to go with it. But we're going to add a black mask. And then we're going to go use our dirt generator. And we're going to pick the dirt generator. So now, see how I put it on there? And I can play with the parameters on here. I can adjust how much of the dirt shows up. I can adjust the contrast of it. I can invert it and then adjust the contrast. Just the amount. Or I can just go back the way it was. Invert's good for some things, but it doesn't really help with everything. So that's how much dirt and the contrast of the dirt. I can also say tell it to use triplanar. And what what triplanar does is um, instead of doing everything with orientation based on your UV maps, it uses the X, Y, and Z coordinates. So you tend to get less, less uh, deformations around your UV map. And so it'll work on things. 
it'll work on things that don't have the same UV map. So if I wanted to save this and use it for something else, it's better to use triplanar. Uh, triplane to uh, contrast doesn't seem to do anything. Grunge amount. Can drop that down a little bit. So now I have a much rustier looking axe head than I had before. And if I want to do some more stuff with it, I can do that as well. So if I wanted to put, um, I can even do things like I can add a uh, normal to put like a raised spot on the side or something. Or if I wanted to do that, let's just see what else. What do we have in here? smart masks in there oh yeah smart mask or basically what i'm doing is i'm creating a mask these are called masks and a smart mask is kind of like a smart material so it's got a bunch of these things already defined so if i wanted to do like um rust for example i could let's turn off my rust here my rust oh no that's the dark material mm. This one, that's my rust. This is the paint on the edge, okay. So if I wanna uh, do, I could use this one to put rust on here. Where's it at, where'd it go? Right here, rust. And just drag it on. And you'll notice that it's white. That's because it uses a white color. And by default, that's the that's the way it, it is because I didn't specify what to use here. So if I could come here and I could change this color and say, let's use a black. Uh, now it's that color. Well, that's not what I want for rust. I want rust to look like, like this rust, right? So instead of that, <clears throat> what I could do is go back to materials, pick that rust, and drop it. I think I can drop it right there. Yep, there we go. So that's the same thing as if I had added a black mask and then did it myself manually, right? So, and that looks pretty cool, right? That looks better than what I did. Mine's more uniform. His is more, his. This, the one that, the, the smart mask does it more isolated, or I could combine the two together. It kind of blends together too much, so we don't want to do that. And so what's cool about this smart mask, <clears throat> is that it has more than just the material, just the look, the visual. It also has things in there that affect the height map, and they used a grunge that affects the uh, like the normal. So you can see that it's more bumpy, where mine was just more of a uh, visual, because I didn't add <clears throat> I didn't add filters and things to affect the normal and the height map, where in the smart one they've already done that. So sometimes it's good to to go find smart masks that do what you want. And sometimes it's fun to make your own or use a combination of the two. So just like using smart materials, sometimes you get some really good results. Um, <clears throat> sometimes just using a smart mask, you get good results. But what you end up with is you, you get to play around with it and you really get to see. So I like that, but I'm going to turn mine down a little bit. So I'm going to adjust my dirt level. On my rust, give it less. Yeah, I like that. And again, I could change the grunge map that we're using in here and, and choose a different grunge. Um, also, this edge masking, it makes it so more it's more pronounced at the edges or less pronounced at the edges. And sometimes you want it to do that. Sometimes you don't want it to do that. Okay. So now we have. Something that looks, uh, I think, a lot better. But it's uh, it's almost too shiny for me, but that's okay. So there we have it. There is your axe. <clears throat> and then all we need to do is export that and take it in the second life. And we have textures for our, our axe. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, 
Oh, yeah, I wanted to go back and try to see if we could get that to create the uh, smart material for the axe handle. So I think what reason I did this is because I don't have a group. So if we go in here and I say, let me if it's a group. And then I take all of these. Uh, I don't even need that one because there's nothing in there. Take all of these and move them in this group. And then name the group uh, my X. My X smart material. I don't know. So let's just call it my X weird. Now I think I can create a smart material. Yep, there it is. Create smart material. And boom. And there it is. It's going to create the thumbnail for me in a second. But um, okay. So there it is, my axe wood. I now have that, and I can use that on anything. So now I can delete these. So now I have nothing applied to it, right? And I can just drag that on and see how it looks. Boom! And there you go. So I have a smart material that I can then use on anything I want. And it'll look kind of like this. Okay, so that's how you do it. So that's why, in order to create the smart material, it has to be in a group. Then you just set the group up and you name it, and the name that you give the group is what the smart material is going to get named in. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think that's it for today. I'm going to go ahead and end it here. If you have any questions, uh, we can we can talk about that. So there's a lot of things. You, I mean, there's so many things you can do. So I'll try and come up with some unique scenarios or if you have some specific questions like you want to know how to put a label or a sticker on something like the logo or if you want to do like an embossed like an imprinted logo of <clears throat> like the name of the, the blacksmith or something you have that carved into the side of this how could we do those things how could we uh, how could we achieve some of those kind of effects I, I can talk about those things too and show you how to do it um, or if you have any specific questions on this, let me know as well, and we'll see what we can do. But, but anyway, that's kind of how to play around with so using masks, how to just paint directly using a mask, um, how to use filters, how to use generators. So you got to see the blur, the leveling, quite a few different things today. So it was pretty fast. Anyway, if you have questions, let me know. You can contact me in Second Life Bander Tyrell. Second Life name is Bandor Benningboro. Um, or you can contact me through through the YouTube channel. Make sure you like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of these great videos when they come out. And then please feel free to leave comments and ask questions either in YouTube or in Second Life. We will talk to you guys next time. See ya!